Hastings? Yeah, so it's a freestanding. I'm Gerald Newman, one of the organizers of the conference, uh, and I want to express my thanks uh, both to uh, all the panelists uh, and speakers uh, who have contributed so much to us uh, so far, uh, and to all those who helped us in putting uh, the conference together. Uh, I should begin with a small announcement, which is that a watch was found on the floor in the room where the lunches were. Uh, and if anyone can identify uh, that watch and tell me that they lost it, um, I'm happy to surrender possession of it. We now move uh, to the second panel on contemporary issues. Uh, we've heard a lot about history and the consequences uh, of history uh, for the current situation, uh, some analysis of uh, current issues. Uh, Professor uh, Duffy Ponsa referred to the fact that there was this tantalizing reference in the Boumediene case uh, to the Supreme Court's uh, majority sense that over time uh, the constitutional status of a territory might change. Uh, is that uh, the hint that there is room, even in the judicial branch, uh, for development uh, of the insular cases? Uh, is that something that we have the time to wait for, uh, or are the, the judicial branch not the place uh, to be looking for, and solutions outside the judicial branch uh, are the ones on which we should be concentrating. Uh, also, uh, Professor Rivera Ramos referred to the fact that there are a number of different territories, and the different territories have different situations and different needs. Uh, and in fact, what is, what is the good future for some territories uh, might be different from what is the good future for other territories. Um, I think that's another point uh, that I would like to remind us of uh, in starting uh, this panel. Now I'd like to introduce the three speakers uh, who will be bringing us uh, reflections on contemporary issues regarding the territories. Uh, they will be speaking uh, in order, uh, from my right to my further right, uh, and in alphabetical order. Uh, first, Professor Shemin Keitner is professor of law at the University of California Hastings College of the Law. Uh, she is an author of a book, The Paradoxes of Nationalism, and dozens of shorter works on the relationship among law, communities, and borders. She clerked for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada holds a bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard, a JD from Yale, uh, and a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. She serves on the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law and is an advisor on the ALI's fourth restatement of foreign relations law. Uh, Professor Rogers M. Smith is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania and Chair of the Penn Program on Democracy, Citizenship, and Constitutionalism. He is the author or co-author of many articles and six books, including Still a House Divided, Race and Politics in Obama's America with Desmond King, uh, Stories of Peoplehood, and Civic Ideals, uh, Conflicting Visions of Citizenship in U.S. History to which I hear we may be promised a sequel. Civic Ideals received six best book prizes from four professional associations and was a finalist for the 1998 Pulitzer Prize in History. Uh, Smith was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, and of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Uh, and then our third panelist, Michael F. Williams, uh, is a partner at Kirkland and Ellis in Washington, D.C., where his practice includes trial and appellate litigation in courts across the United States. He represents the American Samoa government and, I will say, uh, the congressional delegate uh, of American Samoa uh, in Tuawa versus United States, a case in which plaintiffs are arguing to the D.C. Circuit 
that American Samoans should be birthright citizens of the United States under the 14th Amendment. Uh, before joining Kirkland and Ellis, Mr. Williams clerked for Chief Justice Douglas Ginsburg on the DC Circuit and Justice Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court uh, of the United States. So we look forward to being enlightened uh, by all three of them. And I will immediately invite Professor Keitner to take the floor. So thank you very much um, for the introduction, for the invitation to be here. Uh, of course, our um, moderator did not introduce himself, but uh, Jerry Newman, of course, is uh, really a, a leading light in a lot of these areas and um, contributed to a volume which, with, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar, uh, the Foreign in, in a Domestic Sense volume uh, that this morning's speaker, Christina Duffy Ponza, co-edited. Um, and, and that volume, really, I've found um, extremely illuminating in returning to the subject of self-determination, particularly in the context of the Puerto Rico-U.S relationship, uh, and I would commend it to all of you, and I'm just delighted to be able to participate this time around in really a reconvening of some of the authors uh, in that contribution and a, a new look at uh, some very longstanding issues uh, that continue to perplex uh, scholars and, and practitioners, obviously, and, and most importantly, the people uh, involved in and impacted by the frameworks that we're all discussing here today. Uh, I've been invited to give you primarily an international law perspective. Uh, we had some international law creeping in this morning in the questions and also uh, certainly in the keynote speech. Uh, and I'd be happy to field questions uh, about any international law aspects that I don't canvas in my uh, sort of opening remarks, since we do want to be uh, attentive to time and uh, make sure we leave uh, plenty of opportunity for all of you to raise your concerns as well. Uh, of course, this conference is convened under the auspices of the Harvard Human Rights Project. And I think thinking of uh, Puerto Rico's status as a human rights issue is entirely appropriate uh, for a variety of reasons, some of which were mentioned uh, particularly at lunchtime. Uh, the, the offshoots of these issues, of course, can take us in many different directions. There was talk at lunch about uh, something that, of course, Professor Newman is a uh, an expert in and intimately has thought about uh, in intimate ways the relationship between territory and membership to our definitions of who belongs in the political community, what entitlements they have. Uh, I know my um, colleague Professor Smith is going to talk about the citizenship dimension of many of the issues we're confronting today. Uh, but another question is the status of Puerto Rico itself in the international community. Uh, so again, leaving to our third panel discussions about uh, the current status of Puerto Rico and, and concrete ways of moving forward, uh, hopefully I can provide a bit of an overview, starting with the insular cases. And interestingly, you know, insular cases are not usually where we start in international law talking about these issues. Um, but of course, I would be remiss as a speaker in not addressing the title of our conference. Uh, and so uh, let's look for international law in the insular cases, and you don't have to look that far to find it. Uh, and Justice White's concurring opinion in Downs, uh, and Professor Rivera-Sorama is obviously very uh, familiar with this, is nodding. It's, it, he's looking to international law. He's getting his justification from international law, and he tells us, and, and I'm going to quote a fair bit in my comments, but I think it's, you know, they say it better than I can and, and let them speak for themselves. Uh, in talking about you know, what Congress can do with these new territories, he says, Justice White, it may not be doubted that by the general principles of the law of nations, every government which is sovereign within its sphere of action possesses as an inherent attribute the power to acquire territory by discovery, by agreement or treaty, and by conquest. It cannot also be gainsaid that as a general rule, wherever a government acquires territory, as the result of any of the modes above stated, the relation of the territory to the new government is to be determined by the acquiring power in the absence of stipulations upon the subject. Now, horrible as it may seem to modern ears, that was the international law of the time. And so Justice White cites Halleck's treatise, which is on the sort of shelf of every judge worth his salt, uh, and invoked also the Declaration of Independence, which was cited this morning as somehow in tension with the subsequent imperialist project upon which the United States embarked. But of course, as we heard, uh, the racism inherent in that project made it, at least to that generation, seem um, not contradictory at all, right? I mean, what you do as an Anglo-Saxon power is you go out and acquire territories uh, with inhabited by peoples who need your tutelage, essentially. Uh, and so uh, the United States Declaration of Independence, right, proclaimed that the United States 
could do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. Uh, and one of those things was acquire territories. Uh, and in fact, in Justice White's words, to deny that, right, to deny the power of the United States to acquire territory would be, quote, to say that the United States is helpless in the family of nations and does not possess that authority, which has at all times been treated as an incident of the right to acquire. Um, so this really went you know, hand in hand with the United States' self-affirmation and declaration of its own international status as a sovereign nation state, right? And there are issues with the term nation state, but I'll, I'll use it for, the, um, for convenience today. Uh, and one of those things was precisely right to acquire territories and itself then to dictate what the, what the relationship of the territories to the acquiring power would be. Now, um, that's going to be what, what I'll call today uh, the paradigm of conquest, essentially, right? The international law paradigm of conquest uh, that reigned at the time and in which the insular cases, and particularly uh, Justice White's concurrence, which has become so fundamental to our understanding, no pun intended, of the uh, relationship between the territories uh, and the United States, really were embedded in this conquest paradigm. Uh, I'm happy to say, as many of you know, that international law no longer <laughs> embraces the conquest paradigm and has moved towards what I'll call a consent paradigm. Uh, so let me just trace a little bit that movement. Uh, and then our question is going to be, uh, and I'll take the prerogative that some of this morning's speakers took as well and say, in my short time, I will leave you with the problem <laughs> rather than necessarily resolving it. The problem is, what do we do? What do we do with the fact that international law has moved to a consent paradigm, but some of the, uh, certainly some of the doctrine, some of the constitutional law provisions, and some of the mindset, quite frankly, uh, of the players in this you know, ongoing question of how do we reconcile what we all now accept to be a much more legitimate, egalitarian, forward-looking paradigm, the consent paradigm, what do we do with these remnants of, of bits of authoritative uh, case law and so forth, statutes, that are rooted still in the conquest paradigm? And that's really uh, how I would characterize or think about the fundamental challenge from an international law perspective. Um, in the interest of being a little bit practical as well, in the last couple of minutes, I'll talk specifically about um, the three options that are presented, at least uh, by authoritative United Nations resolutions, as uh, consistent with the consent paradigm. Now, some people have taken issue with the extent to which they're all consistent with the consent paradigm. But nonetheless, we're told uh, that statehood, which of course is an option and it's been discussed this morning, that is integration with the United States. Uh, independence as a sovereign nation state are both consistent with this consent paradigm, as would be something called free association. And so, I'll, as I said, I'll elaborate on that a little bit further. Of course, the important thing being not only the ultimate status, but the process through which that status is reached. And there, again, we come up against this problem, this legacy of the conquest paradigm, where under constitutional law, which, which all of you are um, you know, much more erudite in that area than I am, but the, the understanding that we've uh, come to have is that it would basically be Congress's decision whether or not to grant any of these statuses, which of course is intrinsically at odds with the idea of a consent paradigm, right? Um, so there's definitely a, a tension or a paradox there in terms of process. Um, but the idea anyway is, is that process and not only outcomes must be consistent with the consent paradigm uh, under contemporary international law. All right, so you're all familiar with the Treaty of Paris, uh, but again, embedded in this conquest paradigm, it was actually not remarkable at the time that the Treaty of Paris stipulated that the uh, civil rights and political status of the native inhabitants of the formerly Spanish territories shall be determined by Congress. Again, that is not at all to endorse it, but just to illustrate the way in which it was consistent with dominant understandings of, of the time. Uh, and as Professor Newman has pointed out in the book edited by Professor Duffy, uh, the fundamental Republican deficit of the Constitution Constitution is in fact, right, that it restricts national representation to the states while giving the national organs governing power over the territories. So this disconnect, this disjunction uh, is embedded in at least, right, uh, our current understandings of what the Constitution permits, absent further action by Congress. Uh, and that was not cured by the Jones Act, of course. I mean, we heard it at lunchtime how important US citizenship is, particularly to those of an integrationist bent, right, who just want uh, Puerto Rico to be able to be a state equal with the other states in the Union. 
Um, but that was, as you well know, a sort of unilateral act uh, of Congress. And again, it, it's somewhat ironic, but one has to understand the mentality of these people, that the Jones Act was signed into law by President Wilson uh, just 10 months before he delivered his famous 14-point speech. Uh, and some of you may know, uh, point five of that speech provided for, uh, quote, a free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty, the interests of the populations concerned must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. Now, of course, there were at you know, equal status. Right? <laughs> we're not quite at the, let the people decide yet, right? But we're moving towards this consent paradigm, uh, which really reaches its apogee in the United Nations system. Uh, so the United Nations Charter, as you may well know, uh, international treaty, sort of the mother of all international treaties, uh, we often call it because it uh, essentially constitutes right, the international order in which we're now all living. Uh, and it's Article 1, uh, sub point 2, right up front and center, says one of its purposes uh, of the Charter and the United Nations system is to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. Uh, and chapter uh, 11, article 73, so perhaps less familiar, although probably not to people in this room, uh, than the preamble in the first articles of the charter, talks about the responsibilities of those countries like the United States at the time who were administering territories that had not been fully integrated into their uh, political system, uh, and refer to those territories as administrations of territories whose people have not yet attained a full measure of self-government. So what is going to be sort of the gold standard from the United Nations perspective going forward? It's have the peoples, right? And again, here, as you well know, we have a question of, well, do we mean the people, Puerto Ricans living in Puerto Rico? Do we mean Puerto Ricans including the diaspora? But somehow the idea that this people right, has achieved, quote, a full measure of self-government. So that's what we're going to try to uh, achieve, and indeed what the United Nations Charter, before we even get to the ICCPR that was mentioned at lunchtime, uh, what the Charter guarantees. Now, interestingly, right, going back, and this is something I hadn't looked at before, but going back to the debate surrounding the passage of Public Law 600, uh, in which Puerto Rico's constitution, uh, first of all, the, the process for uh, establishing, establishing a constitution, as you know, was, was set in place, and then the constitution itself was passed by the people of Puerto Rico, and then with congressional modification, itself a problem, right, but was in fact adopted. Uh, the idea that this um, public law was bringing us into compliance, us, the United States, with our United Nations Charter obligations was actually uh, evidenced in, in many of the congressional reports at the House and Senate levels, uh, floor speeches and so forth. Uh, there really was a sense that what we're doing or trying to do or trying to show that we're doing, we're trying to look like we're doing, <laughs> uh, is coming into compliance with our charter obligations, right? Um, and and as, as, again, those of you who are steeped in this history well know, this was a story that the then governor of Puerto Rico uh, and also um, the special representative uh, to the committee charged in the United Nations with uh, figuring out whether a uh, former colony had in fact achieved a full measure of self-government. This was a story that they themselves promulgated, okay? The idea that this was uh, essentially Puerto Rico's self-determination moment. Now, um, self-determination is an ongoing process, right? So it's not a use it or lose it proposition. Uh, in fact, I was privileged to give a talk in the Faroe Islands about a dozen years ago and ended up, uh, I wasn't gonna tell the story, but here we go. Um, on the front page of the Faroese paper with, of course, you know, some headline that I couldn't understand, the Faroese, uh, and it was translated to me uh, by, by someone who had invited me as, you know, self-determination is not like virginity, <laughs> right? Um, so feminist critique of that headline aside, uh, apparently that message stuck. Uh, so if, if nothing else sticks from the presentation, uh, you can remember that. Uh, so. So Puerto Rico had a self-determination moment, right? But the question is, uh, or, or the point is, even if it wasn't as legitimate a self-determination moment as the actors at the time tried to make it appear, is somewhat inconsequential today, right? The point is, this is an ongoing right, uh, and, and so not one that, that is lost upon exercise. Uh, but again, I think something that's, that's worth retaining and something that I will canvas in greater detail in the written contribution to these proceedings is the extent to which the actors at the time said what we're doing in adopting Public Law 600 is securing the formal consent of Puerto Ricans to this arrangement. It's an arrangement, as you <coughs> famously know, quote, in the nature of a compact. 
Uh, and in fact, multiple representations were made at very high levels to the United Nations uh, that this was an arrangement of, of sort of mutual consent that could not be modified except for through mutual consent. Uh, and in fact, the Constitutional Convention of Puerto Rico, uh, there was a statement to the effect that thus we attain the goal of complete self-government, the last vestiges of colonialism having disappeared in this principle of compact, okay? Uh, now, history has shown uh, that not only is that uh, sort of an overstatement in terms of reality, but most importantly, in my view, an overstatement in terms of the, the felt experience and lived experience of the people on the island, right? Uh, so again, formalities aside, what really matters is, is does a people feel that it has achieved a full measure of self-government? And the representations made in the 1950s, obviously, um, we've heard today, are not representative of, of the feeling of a large segment of the population. So the question is where to go from here. Uh, and again, um, fast forwarding to 1960, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1541, with which many of you may be familiar, says uh, there are three options. Three options for territories that have not yet achieved a full measure of self-government. Now, post-1953, Puerto Rico is no longer on the list of non-self-governing territories uh, maintained by the United Nations. Uh, incidentally, and we're going to hear about the Samoan litigation in a few minutes, uh, on that list still are the U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and Guam. But Puerto Rico is no longer on that list as by virtue of essentially Public Law 600 and the adoption of a Puerto Rican constitution. Um, but options still available to Puerto Rico under international law include emergence as a separate independent sovereign state, integration into the United States in the form of statehood, again, from an international law perspective, irrespective of what domestic law measures uh, may or may not be necessary to achieve that, that outcome, or free association. Now, free association is a really interesting idea because in the international law sense of free association, we're talking about uh, three other former territories of the United States, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Palau. Those countries, right, have uh, seats in the United Nations, compacts of free association, they're called, right, with the United States. And no question, a, a subordinate political relationship to the United States, but one in which they at least, by all accounts, have some sense that they are, again, full members of the community of nation states, right, by virtue of the fact that this free association relationship really is a relationship between, at least formally, although of course not in terms of economic political power, uh, sovereign nation states. Okay, that is not, as you well know, what Puerto Rico currently has, even though, of course, the Spanish term for commonwealth, right, is Estado Libre Asociado. Uh, and again, in my written contribution, it's quite interesting the, the extent to which uh, the actors at the time thought that maybe by, by putting that in there as the Spanish term, they could maybe nudge the legal reality a little bit closer to what they wanted, uh, and justifiably so, which was a, a formal relationship between equals. Uh, and so perhaps the next, hope it won't be a full century, of political development in the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico might be moving towards something that is more genuinely an association of countries that will never be equal in fact. But most of the 193 countries in the United Nations are not equal in fact. There are differences in size, in territory, in population, in economic power. The question is for each party to feel legitimately uh, that it has preserved its dignity. The term comes up in discussions all of the time. And how best to do that, uh, I will very much look forward to uh, our third panel and discussing some of the ways forward. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here in the company of uh, so many uh, that I greatly admire. My uh, work primarily is on citizenship, and I will uh, discuss uh, four issues of uh, territorial citizenship that are very much alive uh, today. They are intrinsically important. Uh, but they are also exemplary of more general issues of citizenship uh, that I think are uh, prevalent in, and central in the 21st century. Uh, 
issues of what I and others call differentiated citizenship, uh, raising the questions of what forms of distinctions among citizens are consistent with civic equality uh, and what sort uh, are not. Now, the insular cases through its incorporated, unincorporated uh, distinction uh, did create uh, different forms of citizenship, of political uh, membership with territorial status uh, governed by Congress, ultimately, as we have heard. And those decisions were part of an early 20th century pattern of creating differentiated citizenships, forms of second-class citizenship, including uh, Jim Crow segregation, uh, that we have uh, since uh, rightly repudiated uh, creating movements toward making citizenship a more uniform status with the same bundles of rights and duties for all. Uh, but uh, in recent decades, not only have some older forms of civic differentiation persisted, uh, but there are many new kinds of civic differentiation uh, that are uh, being uh, created and uh, many of these are uh, consequences of the international movements to establish self-determination and human rights because those have been part fed into developments uh, that simultaneously have created forms of uh, devolution, uh, uh, more uh, power for uh, subnational uh, groups under federal systems, indigenous communities, uh, et cetera. And uh, they've also fostered uh, transnational unions, the EU uh, being uh, the most uh, prominent, but there's also a much weaker African Union, uh, uh, Union of South African Republic, uh, South American Republics that are uh, uh, nations, uh, all of which um, uh, profess concern to uh, uh, promote uh, rights for all. Uh, we're also uh, seeing patterns of migration that mean in the 21st century uh, that we have more multi-level citizenships, more multinational citizenships, more quasi-citizenships in which some persons overseas have uh, rights uh, that others, and, uh, and many multicultural policies uh, that uh, give uh, different citizens different bundles of rights and duties. And all these developments have made central uh, the question of, well, what forms of civic differentiation uh, can we say are genuinely different but equal? Uh, what kinds are invidious inequalities? Uh, and controversies over citizenship in America's territories are revealing. I'll talk about controversies over uh, voting rights that we've heard, uh, but also over rights of expatriation, uh, rights of birthright citizenship, and uh, rights to special kinds of uh, cultural accommodations on uh, the denials of voting rights and birthright citizenship, uh, we see uh, new challenges to old kinds of differentiation uh, in regards to expatriation and some kinds of multicultural accommodations. We see efforts to expand uh, uh, or create new civic differentiations. And uh, I want to suggest uh, there are four different political sources leading to different kinds of uh, citizenship statuses for different groups. The first is uh, remedial policies that are concerned to address unjust uh, past forms of uh, civic differentiation as well as continuing uh, discrimination. And you can, of course, think of uh, race and gender uh, affirmative action measures as uh, part of that. Uh, but there are also uh, accommodationist policies uh, that seek to alter bundles of rights and duties so that different groups can uh, flourish equally but in distinct ways. Um, uh, and while these sometimes are reinforced by remedial purposes, they are analytically uh, distinct exemptions from civic education for the uh, Amish on the one hand, uh, multilingual ballots for recent European immigrant groups on the other are accommodations uh, for greater uh, uh, equality uh, that um, uh, aren't uh, 
justified in remedial terms. There's also uh, forms of civic differentiation that I call legacy policies. They were adapted for past reasons that no one champions now, but in a pattern uh, social scientists call path dependency, uh, it so happens that there's not enough agreement on how they should be changed to produce a political movement that can actually generate change. So they don't have champions, but they don't have uh, enough uh, opponents pushing for change uh, to achieve change. And I think for uh, a long time, uh, uh, Puerto Rico might have been said to be an example of this legacy uh, in part because Puerto Ricans uh, uh, in four referenda were uh, deeply divided on changing the status quo, and if so, in what uh, direction. Uh, the most recent 2012 referendum uh, has changed that, as we've heard, uh, with consequences that have yet to be seen. Um, and those consequences connect with my uh, fourth category that I call uh, preservationist policies favoring uh, civic differentiation. Preservationist policies are ones in which powerful political actors are seeking to preserve uh, their economic interests, their national security interests, their political power interests uh, by uh, maintaining certain kinds of civic differentiation. Uh, they often are therefore opponents of uh, remedial or accommodationist uh, kinds of civic differentiation, uh, but sometimes uh, existing uh, structures of power and economic interest can be preferred, preserved through innovations in uh, status, and we'll see examples of that. Now, the paper goes through uh, the uh, different American territories, and I won't run through that uh, for this audience, uh, it also briefly looks at France to call attention to uh, the fact that this pattern of heightening civic differentiation is occurring elsewhere, even in France, which of all the world's republic uh, boasts most of its commitment to civic unity and uniformity. But that has changed in the last 15 years uh, in regard to uh, the French territories, which display a bewildering variety of statuses I won't uh, review, uh, but uh, the French government is actively seeking to change those statuses, uh, uh, trying to get some territories to have more autonomy, trying to get them to consolidate, um, uh, in part because it's hoping that will make them more economically self-supporting and they will demand less aid from France. So this is a preservationist motive in terms of uh, French wealth. So Jacques Chirac um, said in 2000, uniform statuses are over and each overseas collectivity should evolve if it so wishes toward a somewhat tailored status. Nicolas Sarkozy is president. Unity of the Republic does not imply a uniformity of its institutions. Every territory should have an organization adapted to its own characteristics. As long as this does not affect the principle of unity of the Republic, uh, by which he meant overseas territories are French and will remain French despite their rights to self-determination. Um, so uh, this pattern of uh, uh, civic differentiation is not just a legacy of the past moving toward uniformity. It is something uh, in which there are lots of emerging developing issues. And now I want to talk about um, uh, four issues in uh, the American territories. The first is the question of whether territorial residents uh, should have uh, voting rights. Um, uh, as we've already uh, heard, uh, uh, this has been uh, passionately <coughs> um, argued for by uh, Puerto Ricans. Uh, Gregorio uh, Igartua de la Rosa uh, has um, brought a series of cases uh, in recent years uh, saying uh, that uh, uh, Puerto Ricans should have a constitutional right to vote in national elections for president and uh, vice president, and then uh, for the House of Representatives. Um, I won't uh, review all those uh, legal arguments about why voting is a fundamental right of citizenship and that if American citizens overseas get it, they should certainly get it uh, while they're uh, in Puerto Rico, but the uh, fundamental uh, 
Uh, U.S. answer has been, number one, the Constitution says that you have to be a state to be represented in the Electoral College, um, and only the people of the states are represented in the House of Representatives. Um, and it's also added this uh, accommodationist argument. We've allowed Puerto Ricans to change their status if they want, and they uh, uh, haven't uh, uh, done so. Uh, uh, but um, uh, there can be uh, little uh, doubt and we will continue to see in response to the 2012 uh, referendum uh, that this denial of voting rights also has a preservationist uh, motive on the part of many powerful uh, American interests. Uh, Republicans are concerned that if Puerto Ricans get voting rights, they'll vote overwhelmingly uh, Democratic. And as we heard, uh, representatives of smaller states uh, uh, feel that uh, uh, having eight representatives from uh, Puerto Rico would eclipse their uh, significance. Um, there have also been issues of expatriation from Puerto Rico, beginning uh, with Juan Maria Bras, but being decided in the case of Alberto uh, Lozado Colon, uh, who argued uh, that they uh, could renounce their U.S. citizenship at American embassies overseas, uh, but return to Puerto Rico and have uh, residential residencies there and participate as Puerto Rican citizens in Puerto Rican uh, politics. Uh, the U.S. government uh, has rejected this, uh, claiming that they hadn't renounced all their rights of citizenship because they hadn't renounced the right to travel outside of the U.S. and come back to the uh, U.S. and you had to renounce all your rights, even rights that resident aliens have, um, uh, or you hadn't really renounced your citizenship. Clearly here, I think uh, there is a uh, preservationist motive, the concern that we shouldn't have citizens who are loyal to Puerto Rico but not to the U.S. Um, standing against this proposed form of uh, civic differentiation. Uh, and then there are issues of birthright citizenship brought primarily by Filipinos about to be deported who said that their birth on U.S. territory or their parents' birth should give them birthright citizenship under the 14th Amendment, but uh, citizens of Guam have also claimed this, um, uh, and now we're getting the claims on behalf of uh, American Samoans. Uh, the courts have answered by trying to distinguish between the 13th Amendment, uh, which bans servitude within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction, and the 14th Amendment citizenship clause, which doesn't have this reference to or any other place. Um, uh, uh, in the Rabang decision, uh, uh, Judge uh, Harry Pregerson argued that, um, uh, look, the framers of the 14th Amendment weren't thinking about the language of the 13th Amendment primarily. They were thinking about uh, the common law doctrines defining birthright citizenship, which did uh, protect uh, such uh, territorial claims. Uh, but uh, the U.S. courts have rejected this argument, uh, I think, uh, clearly out of preservationist uh, concerns that um, uh, if Filipinos could create, could claim citizenship rights, um, uh, we would have lots of immigrants uh, that many Americans uh, don't uh, uh, want. Um, uh, now, in the Samoan case, uh, uh, the congressman uh, from American Samoa is opposing uh, related claim, which is presented as being even stronger in part because the Philippines uh, were officially always intended for independence, uh, whereas the U.S. and American Samoa are in enduring uh, union. Um, the uh, uh, argument is uh, that if uh, American Samoans become not just nationals but U.S. Uh, citizens, then various kinds of accommodations, including to uh, their uh, customary land laws, um, you can only uh, uh, extend land to uh, other American Samoans, uh, those might be in jeopardy. Uh, uh, but um, uh, the fourth category of special accommodations, uh, there are several cases from American uh, Samoa uh, and also from the Northern Mariana Islands uh, in which uh, various uh, uh, judges, including uh, Douglas Ginsburg, have uh, affirmed that um, there, uh, it is appropriate uh, to uh, allow um, uh, forms of land law that might be viewed as restrictive racial covenants in um, uh, the U.S. as uh, part of an effort uh, to do two things. Um, uh, these constitutional uh, uh, provisions, if equal protection in the in uh, this 
the form applied to the states were imposed. Um, uh, the courts have said it would be both impractical and anomalous. It would hamper the United States' ability to form political alliances and acquire necessary military outposts, and it would also operate as a genocide pact for diverse native cultures. So both for preservationist interests and accommodationist interests, uh, the courts have said these kinds of um, uh, deferences to distinctive uh, land laws and other customs um, should be uh, upheld. Uh, well, in the paper, I have a final uh, section of normative reflections where I do try to give uh, my answers to these uh, questions. I uh, am uh, running out of time and can't go through that uh, at length, uh, but I will just say uh, briefly uh, that I do understand the American uh, Constitution, uh, as Lincoln did, uh, as an enterprise uh, dedicated to uh, realizing uh, rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness uh, for all citizens first, American citizens first, and then as many uh, as others. I think that when the American government through its course of policies has shaped the aspirations, the identities, and pursuits of happiness of people, it has an obligation uh, to try to find policies that accommodate those aspirations uh, so long as they don't threaten other vital uh, American interests. Uh, and I think uh, that um, there is no great threat to the American people as a whole uh, from extending uh, voting rights. Rhode Island might lose, Republicans might lose, but America uh, would not uh, lose. I think there's a minimal threat by allowing people to expatriate themselves and still um, uh, uh, be Puerto Ricans. Uh, and if Puerto Rico's status is changed, that threat will uh, vanish completely. Um, I do think that the birthright citizenship issues are uh, tougher because of the issues of immigration and the uh, concerns to accommodate uh, distinctive cultural uh, traditions. Uh, but I tend to favor uh, uh, immigration as a source of strength for the country. And I think that the precedents uh, saying that accommodations represent uh, compelling interest uh, reassure us on that score. Uh, so I think uh, we ought to move to embrace many of these forms of uh, modified civic status uh, that America is largely uh, resisting. But my prediction as an empirical political scientist is that there's just going to be continuing contestation, uh, that U.S. preservationist concerns uh, will loom large, and that the uh, solution to issues of different but equal citizenship will be elusive, but they are not questions that we can avoid. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Williams. I'm a partner at Kirkland & Ellis. I want to thank the organizers of this conference for letting me be here today and start my discussion with two caveats. The first is I'm a practicing lawyer. Okay, I'm speaking here. I represent the congressman from American Samoa, Congressman Falio Mavainga. I'm not speaking on his behalf unless I specifically note that I am over the course of these lectures. So nothing that I say should be deemed as an admission or held against him. That's caveat one. Caveat number two is I'm not an expert like the other people you've heard from today. It's daunting to have to sit here on the dais with everybody else. Everybody has such a depth of knowledge, and I'm just an attorney who's trying to win a case. So you should take everything that I say with a grain of salt. For the students here, don't rely on anything that I say. Check it with the professors and the actual experts. Read the books that they've written. But, but, but I hope that nevertheless my limited experience can, can, can provide an interesting perspective here. So again, I represent Congressman Falio Mavainga and also the American Samoa government in the Tua Ua citizenship case. Now, I'd like to, over the course of my discussion, first introduce American Samoa a little bit. It's an area that a lot of people haven't visited or the area people aren't familiar with. I'd like to talk about the Tua Ua case a little bit and why Congressman Falio Mavainga and the American Samoa government are taking the position they're taking in that case. And then I'd like to talk about what I think it means for reconsidering the insular cases more generally. Okay, so just to go through the bidding. First, introducing American Samoa. It's a very small set of islands in the South Pacific. It has 55,000 people in it. Okay, so to put that in perspective, if you took the Harvard student body and the Harvard full-time faculty, doubled it, and put them into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you'd have American Samoa, roughly in terms of population. And how far into the Pacific Ocean? It's about six hours by plane from Hawaii to American Samoa. There are flights that come and go twice a week. When you arrive in American Samoa, there's a single road that rings the island. The beach is on one side, 
sporadic villages are on the other side of the island, and the people tend to live in the villages. But you can't get around the island without this road, which is something that, that's going to be important for another part of my discussion. Now, Robert Louis Stevenson in the 1900s, at about the same time that the Insular Cases were being decided, described American Samoa as a footnote to history. And when he described them that way, he was discussing you know, what their relative small size and what their distant location meant for the, you know, the, the world of unfolding events as they stood. But you'll see that American Samoa is also a footnote to American imperial history. It doesn't really fit in with the other narratives that we've heard about American imperialism in many important respects. And so even though, as Professor Sparrow was saying during the first panel, there is this history of using the strategic resources of places like American Samoa, where the island of Tatuila is basically shaped like a V. It's got one of the most perfect natural harbors you'll ever see in your life. There's, there wasn't the same level of oppression or imperialism that you might have found in other US territories. And what I mean by that, I'll quote my client, Congressman Falio Mavainga, who has said very proudly, American Samoa has never been conquered, never been taken as a prize of war, and never been annexed against the will of its people. And this is something that distinguishes American Samoa from the Philippines, from Puerto Rico, from other US territories, and it's also a fierce point of pride for the American Samoan people. To this day, some hundred years after American Samoa became affiliated with the United States, the American Samoa people believe that their relationship with the US has been mutual and voluntary. On April 17, 1900, the American government raised its flag over Tutuila, one of the main islands of American Samoa. That year, Tutuila and Aunu'u, one of the other American Samoan islands, entered into deeds of cession with the United States governments. That is, the high chiefs of American Samoa said, we're going to become a part of the United States. Uh, Tutuila, another, rather, Manua, another island, followed a few years later. So you'll see that it's it, it, very different from the Puerto Rican experience or the, or the experience of, of Guam or the experience of the Philippines, the American Samoa people have a fierce sense of pride in being a part of the United States, but they've also always recognized or always felt that it was on their terms that they became a part of the United States. Now, the American Samoan people were never made citizens by statutory legislation of Congress. Okay, from the, earliest, from the earliest days of American Samoa's affiliation with the United States, the people have never been recognized as citizens. In the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, Section 308 specified that, people, that, the American, that the people in American Samoa are not citizens, but should be U.S. nationals. And by U.S. nationals, they meant to adopt the definition from footnote one of Chief Justice Warren's opinion in uh, Barber versus Morales, where he said, these are people who are entitled to protection of the United States and who have sworn their allegiance to the United States. Okay, this is an old category of definitions. You know, it, it, it raises the specter of these, you know, American Samoans on their island swearing fealty to the United States or something. I mean, it's, it's sort of an anachronistic doctrine. But that's the status that American Samoans have maintained to the present day until the Tua Ua lawsuit, and, and probably through the Tua Ua lawsuit. But I'd like to speak a little bit about what this means in practice. If you are an American Samoan, if you are a U.S. national from American Samoa, you're not a citizen and you may not call yourself a citizen, but you're issued a U.S. passport. It's my understanding from the allegations in the Tua Ua complaint that a passport, U.S. passport, the blue passport we all know, if it's issued to an American Samoan, there's an endorsement on it that says they're non-citizens. That might be true, it might not be. I've seen American Samoans' passport that didn't have the endorsement. My guess is, is that this isn't something that's uniformly applied. But you can come and go to the United States and through the United States very freely. When you re-enter the United States from a foreign country, you re-enter the same way that a U.S. citizen re-enters. You go through the same immigration lines. I've done that with American Samoans in the past as well. As a U.S. national, you can work in the United States. You can pay taxes, and Lord knows they do. You can also join the military. And American Samoans, again, are fiercely proud of the fact that they joined the military in a higher proportion by factors of many of any other state or jurisdiction within the United States government. They may not vote in national elections. I mean, this is something that people from Puerto Rico understand very well. And this is something that's, I, I suppose that citizenship is a necessary but insufficient condition for being allowed to vote in national elections. But the Samoans don't even have that first step, citizenship. But as a general matter, you'll find that American Samoans living in the United States 
are almost completely undifferentiated, undifferentiated from, Amer from American citizens. There are other aspects of American immigration law that favor Samoan U.S. nationals. For example, Samoan U.S. nationals may apply for citizenship in the United States. They still have to take the test. They still have to pay the filing fees. But they only have a six months permanent residency requirement within the United States. So it's a little bit easier for them to become U.S. citizens than other people, than aliens to the United States, for example. Now, given all of this history, and given what we know about American Samoa, it raises the question, we have these people who are proud to be part of the United States, who contribute to the United States, they're in the military, they're paying taxes, but they, they have this separate status which must mean unequal. And it raises the question that I think is posed by the Tua'ua case, which is, you know, what's, what's wrong with Kansas? What's wrong with Samoa? Why is it that you Samoans don't want to be citizens? What is it that doesn't cause you to understand that your separate status means that you necessarily have an unequal status. And to talk about that, I'd like to say the Samoan history, its relationship with the United States, has been one of expanding self-determination. Okay, so in 1967, the Samoan people promulgated their constitution. As of 1977, which is relatively recent, but it's still 40 years ago now, the Samoan people provided for an elected governor to, to run the territory. So these are recent events, but the trend is toward self-determination. So when Falio Mavanga heard about the Tua'ua lawsuit, he faced the choice. Do I support this lawsuit and push for birthright citizenship for those in American Samoa, or do I oppose it? And he chose to oppose it. And now I'll talk about the reasons. The first reason, and I'm going to say this as an advocate, okay, this is going to seem like a jerk thing to say, but it's because the lawsuit's meritless. Just as a doctrinal matter, it's clever enough, it's well written. I, I commend it to everybody. But just as a matter of the case law, it doesn't really pass the merits test. And the reason why is because this argument that a court can afford citizenship to a person is literally unprecedented, right? There are no cases that way. Now we're in front of a great judge in Washington DC, Judge Richard Leon. He's not a judge who's afraid to call things unconstitutional. A couple of weeks after he issued the decision in our case, he struck down the NSA surveillance. I mean, he's a, he's a confident judge, and he's, he's not afraid to say that things are unconstitutional. But he reviewed the case law, and he saw there are no cases supporting this idea of judicial award of birthright independence to a group of people. There are the insular cases, which strongly suggest that, it's, that there can be no judicial award of birthright citizenship to people who, for, who are from unincorporated territories. And then there are recent decisions, even of the Ninth Circuit, judges like Judge Pragerson, who one would think would be sensitive to these sorts of arguments, but who in 1994 in Rabang said, no, birthright citizenship is limited to the incorporated territories, even under the plain text of the 14th Amendment. And, and, and Professor Smith spoke about that a little bit as well. So there's the merits issue, okay? There's also Boumediene, okay? There's the argument that Justice Kennedy is opening a door. And I think Professor Ponza in the first session said, when Justice Kennedy said that, her reaction was, talk is cheap. Okay, and that's a fair reaction when Justice Kennedy's concerned. And I'll tell you, there are three principles to understanding and accurately predicting to a high degree of certainty what Justice Kennedy will do in every case that he decides. And I'm going to tell you one of them. And that one is, he always leaves a beachhead. In all of his published opinions on the Ninth Circuit and on the Supreme Court of the United States, Justice Kennedy has never used the word never. You can Westlaw that, you can Google it. So he always leaves the door open. So when Justice Kennedy says, maybe there's this possibility that territories can build their relationships to a point where you know, the, the normal rules of the insular cases no longer apply, he was, leaving, he was leaving a door open and that's what he does. So you've got to understand it as that. So those are the legal reasons, the doctrinal reasons that the case is meritless. But then the more important reasons for Justice Falio Mavainga and now also the American Samoa government are that he's very concerned that the extension of birthright citizenship, especially by judicial fiat, would interfere with the Samoan way of life. And I think it was very useful to hear Professor Smith talk about the accommodationist approach. And I think that's a great framework. But I think that it looks at all of these things that we need to accommodate in isolation without considering them as a whole. Now I'm going to talk about some elements of Samoan society that are radically different from elements in the United States. But then I want to talk about why it's important not just to list them, but to consider the whole. The first is the communal ownership of property. 
Okay, and again, that's not something that we do in the United States, right? We don't have communal ownership of land. But since its earliest days, the Samoans have said, it's critical and important to us that our families and the chiefs, the Ainga and the Matai, control the allocation of land and that it not be alienated. So much so that when Commander Tilly sailed into Tutuila Bay two weeks after the flag went up over Pongo Pongo, he issued, a, he issued a prohibition on the alienation of Samoan land. He knew that it was important because of talking with the Matai that he had to protect these interests. And he did it from the earliest days of their union with the United States. Second, while not all land in Samoa is communally held, the small percentage of land that is held in fee simple has race-related blood quantum restrictions. Okay, in the United States, we fought a civil war about stuff like blood quantum restrictions and racial classifications on who can hold land. I mean, that's not something that would fly in the United States. And it's great that in cases like Judge Hodel, like, like Hodel you know, esteemed judges like Judge, you know, Judge, Judge Douglas Ginsburg have upheld those restrictions. And Falio Mavanga says in his briefs, he's very confident that even under the strictest scrutiny, you know, there's a basis for upholding those sort of characterizations. There's still this concern that once you have U.S. citizens suing U.S. citizens about racial restrictions on the alienation of land, you're going to run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause. And I'll talk about a third category. And on this one, I want to paint a little bit more of a picture. And it's why that road is important. In Samoa, every night at about 6 p.m. when the sun is setting, there's a communal prayer curfew. It's called the Sa. Sa means two things in Samoa, and it means holy, and it also means forbidden. Okay, so what happens is if you're driving and if you're just an American who doesn't understand Samoan, some very large Samoan men who are wearing their lava lavas come out to your car and say, you're not allowed to drive through the village anymore. You have to stop the car there. You're allowed into somebody's house to pray with them if you want, but otherwise you have to stop and wait until the praying is done. And then you sit there in your car and you put down the window and you can hear singing and beautiful hymns and prayers coming from these Samoan homes. But the point is, it's forced prayer. It's forced religious exercise. Right. Does anybody here know what an eruv is? I don't know that I'm pronouncing it right. Anybody? Okay, that's the wire that Has, you know, Hasidic Jews or Orthodox Jews put around an area so that they can go there within the Sabbath. Okay, the Third Circuit said they're not allowed to do that. Can you imagine if we had forced prayer curfews in the United States? But the point is, because I see him being handed cards, is that when I'm talking about these elements of Samoan culture that are radically different from ours, they're just manifestations of the deeper underlying cultural differences. Samoa is a culture that developed completely independent of Western civilization for thousands and you know, hundreds of years at least. And so when we talk about the differences and the things to accommodate, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there's more to accommodate than just these things. I take it as if somebody were to ask you the difference between boxing and ballet. Oh, he can name some things. Well, the people are hitting each other. There's no music, right? They're not wearing tutus, okay? But the point is, boxing and ballet, you can point out the individual differences and try to accommodate them and try to make them the same, but the underlying purpose of the two activities is completely different, and they've developed completely different, and there's no way to accommodate those differences on a fundamental level. And that's why, and that's why Falio Mavanga, and that's why the American Samoa government are concerned about extending birthright citizenship by fiat to American Samoa. And on this, there's a Samoan saying, that says, I'm not gonna say it in Samoan, but they say, don't cut the tree yet, it's still green. So even though there are arguments, and I appreciate those arguments, that maybe we can accommodate citizenship, maybe we can do new things. The idea is, let's not mess with something that's important for Samoans. Because for them, this isn't a matter of academic interest. It's not a law school exam. They view this as an existential issue. This is their culture. It's their 90-year-old grandmothers. It's what they've baked into their constitution as something that they're going to preserve at all costs. And it was a condition of their having entered the United States that these sort of interests are protected. And that leads to the second point, which is from Falio Mapaenga's view, if there is to be a change, and maybe a case could be made for a change, it needs to come through political processes. And I can imagine the Puerto Ricans in the audience are laughing and laughing when I say political processes. And I can get that because political processes, as other panelists have said, are inefficient, they're riven with private interests over public interests, but Falio Mavanga believes that there shouldn't be a judge in Washington, D.C. who's going to say, I'm going to change this. This is what you agreed to earlier, but I'm going to be the one who says it needs to be different now. So that's my spiel on American Samoa. And I'll add that supporting Falio Mavanga's view and the American Samoa government's view is the history of Hawaii, 
which is something that looms large in the mind of Samoans who are, Samoans who are thinking about this. Because you can look at cases like Rice versus Cayetano. You can look at what happened to the Kamehameha schools, and you can see that Samoans are very, very concerned about losing things you know, just by small decisions. What could be the harm of citizenship? So with that said, I see I'm getting another card. But I'll say, when we talk about reconsidering the insular cases, I mean, first, it's important to consider the insular cases, right? I, was, I, I guess I shouldn't be shocked, but Dean Minow said she never taught the insular cases. I mean, I didn't go to Harvard, so when I hear people from Harvard say that, I'm shocked. But everybody should be aware of what these insular cases are. But I think we should reconsider them in the literal sense, consider them again. I mean, just over the course of the past few hours, I've heard one of the most prominent judges on the federal bench say, and I respect his views and I admire the way that he said it, the insular cases should be eradicated from our constitutional thought. And then I heard Professor Rivera Ramos say, we inhabit the conceptual categories that the insular cases established. And both of those things are true. So we've got to consider, you know, to Professor, to Professor Brown Nagan's question about, you know, whether there's this taint of race, Let's put the past to one side and let's think about what it means for the insular cases today. Because I suspect that if they didn't exist, if you imagine a world where there was no racial U.S. imperialism, we'd have to invent them for American Samoa or we wouldn't be affiliated with them. So the question is, where do we go from here? And on that I'll close because I see there's a zero minute card that's probably coming up. But my point there is as follows. It's when you're thinking about the Constitution, it's a Constitution we're expounding, Okay, for the people of Puerto Rico and for the experts who are in this room, boy, these issues loom large and there's such a depth of knowledge and understanding about these issues. There are political parties devoted to resolving the issues one way or the other. Samoa is not there yet. But as Puerto Rico and as other territories with their millions of people are deciding these issues, you know, I, I think judges, scholars, students in the room will remember, sometimes there's important things in the footnotes, right? So American Samoa might be that footnote to history but there are still 55,000 people with a vibrant culture and a fierce, fierce dedication to their own self-determination who are going to want to know what's happening to the insular cases and their own status. So, so, so don't trip over them as Puerto Rico goes on to, making, to resolving its own issues or as we start making decisions about what this 14th Amendment means. Thank you. So I'm very grateful to the panelists. Uh, I want to say I exercise extreme restraint in serving the zero minute card. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, with the result that I've cut into the time for questions. Uh, so I won't ask a question, much though I wanted to. I'll do that privately later. Uh, and I ask people to come to the microphone. Uh, please identify yourself and please keep your questions brief so that the panelists would have a chance to answer them. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Sobel. I'm a political scientist, and I work on citizen rights and the right to travel. When the judge gave his talk before, he mentioned that some of the intellectual foundations for the insular cases were done at Harvard and Yale. There have been a number of discussions of ways of overturning the insular cases. I'd like to specifically ask this panel and other people can, can answer. Is there currently in the journals, in the literature, the kind of similar articles that could create a foundation for overturning the insular cases? And could you give us sites for a couple of them? Or could somebody please write that article and then let us know? <laughs> and secondly, um, what would be the appropriate litigation strategy, maybe uh, modeled on the Brown strategy, that could ultimately bring to the court a case where the courts would overturn the insular cases? Well, that second question was clearly directed at the practicing lawyer on the panel, <laughs> Mr. Williams. <laughs> who's, who's preserving the insular cases with every fiber of his being right now. But I think, you know, I, I will say the people who brought the Tua Ua case, I think are doing it right. I mean, there has been this critical mass of scholarly literature related to Boumediene there's the history of what happened at Guantanamo, and the justices know about that stuff. I mean, Judge Leon knew about that stuff. He wrote Boumediene at the district court level. The problem there is, I think there, the Samoan people are flying the ointment. You know, there are Samoan plaintiffs who are saying overturn the insular cases. 
but the Samoan government and, and Falio Mabang are saying, we don't want to be a part of this. You know, we're, we're, not the people, we're not the people who you should overturn the insular cases for. With the right plaintiff, I think there might be a better, a better argument. Okay, but what, first of all, I want, the first part of my question, I think, is the intellectual foundations for this. That would be those guys. Are, they, are there <laughs> articles already in the literature, or is somebody going to write one based on this conference that will create the intellectual basis for overturning the insular cases? And then uh, I'll, I'll just turn this back on you. What would be the litigation strategy based on the Either that constitutional law or some other to, to get the court to ultimately overturn them. Uh, I, again, as moderator of the panel, I'm going to say uh, I think there is an intellectual foundation in the journals. I think there may need to be more intellectual foundation in the journals because the result hasn't happened yet. Uh, but uh, there have been articles that have excoriated the insular cases for decades, uh, written by some of the people who've spoken earlier. Uh, and will be speaking later and are speaking now. Uh, the, um, the book, uh, the conference book from 1998, the conference at that other school in New England, uh, uh, is uh, also a, a good source uh, for that. There will be a publication uh, coming out of this conference, but I think New thinking is needed, and we, we need more. Uh, in terms of the roadmap, uh, I'm afraid that Mr. Williams' duty to his client forbids him to lay out that roadmap, <laughs> that roadmap today, but perhaps later uh, he'll be in a position to lay out the roadmap. Can us. I add one point there? Please, uh, Rogers. Uh, I think uh, it's true that there's uh, a great deal of uh, literature effectively critiquing uh, the insular cases. I do think that there's a problem that there is not a lot of literature mapping out an alternative decision in those cases that um, uh, responds to a lot of concerns. And so that's the uh, challenge ahead. In terms of litigation strategy, I'm not a lawyer, but um, I have studied politics of uh, civil rights struggles, and I think that one uh, plausible strategy here uh, suggested by the Supreme Court in Reed versus Colbert is to insist on reading the insular cases uh, as narrowly as possible, more and more narrow, uh, narrowly, until eventually maybe you can strangle them. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Christina Ponza, and uh, this is a question for the uh, attorney. Um, I'm one of the people in the room who's supposed to know a lot about this material, but this is a genuine question. I, can't, I just don't know the answer. Um, given that the constitutional provisions at stake, the Equal Protection Clause, Free Exercise Clause, don't refer to citizens, why is citizenship seen as an obstacle to Samoan cultural practices? Well, I think that there are two answers there. The first is, and we heard Professor Smith say, citizenship carries with it this bundle of, I, th I think the term he used and it's apt, are bundles of rights and privileges. So there's this thought that citizenship, unlike other fundamental rights, the right to a jury trial, has with it, carries with it, all of these other rights to, in such a way that the King versus Morton DC Circuit test of impractical and anomalous shouldn't apply. It carries too much in with it. And the second point is, I think as I'd said, whether or not citizenship means that under strict scrutiny these racial restrictions no longer apply, I think that just as a practical matter, everybody in the room would agree that there's a different case when we're talking about U.S. citizens suing U.S. citizens than U.S. residents, U.S. nationals suing U.S. nationals. The third point I'd add, just not a legal point, but it's a more practical point, is, is that the Samoans are very concerned about making any changes like this because it could have unanticipated consequences. Again, I don't think the Hawaiians went into the Hawaiian experiment saying this is where we wanted to be 100 years or 200 years later. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Weir. I actually represent the plaintiffs in uh, the case uh, involving American Samoa. I represent Lenawate Tuaua, uh, the Samoan Federation of America, a number of other individuals uh, born in American Samoa who are not recognized as citizens. And I just want to address a few points and then, then have a question for, for Mr. Williams. Um, so first, as a, as a matter of history, you, you really did a good job of providing uh, some of the unique history around American Samoa. But, but one thing you did leave out was that those who actually did sign the deeds of session thought that citizenship was part of the deal. Uh, later on, they were told by the US Navy in the 1920s that uh, 
no, you don't, you don't get full US citizenship. You get this other thing called a non-citizen national status. And, and they protested. They had uh, movements in the streets saying that they want to be recognized as full citizens. A congressional delegation came to American Samoa at the time, took the uh, impassioned testimony of American Samoa's traditional leaders, some of whom had signed the initial agreements, brought that back to Congress and said, these people want to be recognized as citizens while still preserving their, uh, their, their cultural practices. And, and those, uh, those laws, are, there was legislation introduced that passed the Senate twice only to be scuttled in, in the House based on US Navy opposition. So from the very beginning, uh, there, there was a sense that uh, citizenship and being an American could be combined with, uh, with, with being a Samoan. And that's, that's really the way my, my, my clients feel about this, is that, they, they, that you can be American and be Samoan too. In fact, they've already done that for over 100 years. Um, just a few other quick points. Uh, he raises that um, you know, really there's not a lot of big differences between non-citizen national status and citizen status, so you, you can work in the United States. Unfortunately, that's not always true. One of our clients lost her job because she's not recognized as a citizen. She, works, she worked uh, in the DMV office in Seattle and lost her job because she had nothing proving she was a citizen except a passport that said she was not. Um, so they can join the military. But again, because they're not citizens, they can't serve as officers in the military unless they naturalize and are recognized as citizens. They also can't vote. Um, you raised that one. Um, seemed, seemed like you suggested a small one. It's actually a big one, not being able to vote. Uh, our, our client, uh, the Samoan Federation of America, uh, serves tens of thousands of American Samoans that live in the greater Los Angeles area who, had they, have they been able to vote, could really influence local elections. So it's not only just about individual denial of the right to vote, but, but really vote dilution of, uh, of, of constituencies that really are uh, put together. And then finally, um, the idea that this is what, what our clients are asking the court to do is, is establish a new citizenship by judicial fiat. All they're asking them to do is say what the law is, say what the Constitution says. The Constitution says if you're born on US soil, you have a right to citizenship. They want the same right as every American, which is if, if you show your birth certificate and show that you're born somewhere on US soil, you have a constitutional right to citizenship that Congress can't take away, um, even as they continue to care about preserving their, their cultural practice. So, so my question is, in your hypothetical double the size of Harvard student body and faculty uh, versus Samoa, American Samoa in a football game, who would win? <laughs> well, that's, 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 a no, that's a no brainer, of course. But, and, and, and I'll answer it first. There are, every, you know, there are only 280,000 Samoans on the planet. Every NFL team has one or two. I mean, they're just very, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson said they're they were guys. like bods. They're big, they're big guys and they're also very athletic. But I would add, I, I'm not gonna respond point to point. I mean, I appreciate the difference of opinion here. I say everybody should come to the DC Circuit argument when it's scheduled. I'm sure that it's going to be very interesting. But I'll also add that I think when we hear about, I, I talked about three categories, voting, which I, I didn't mean to minimize. I just meant that it's familiar to the people here. That is, the people of Puerto Rico know the issues about citizens voting in national elections and, and what it would mean if you were a non-citizen there. But as for these other categorizations, you know, people who have allegedly, and again, it's notice pleading, so it's all allegations now, people who have allegedly been denied commissions because they're U.S. nationals, people who have been denied employment because they're U.S. nationals, one of the plaintiffs in this case, Fatua Natu Mamea, claims that his wife can't was denied an immigrant visa from Fiji, and then was also denied a K-3 visa to help him visit his ailing mother because she's a non-citizen. I mean, those are important issues. But what I'd say is, instead of against the will of the Samoan elected people through their government and through Congressman Paloma Baenga, challenge those categorizations. Those sound like invidious categorizations to me. And as I sit here, I have some imagination, I can't think of a rational basis that would uphold saying that you as a U.S. national and not a U.S. citizen should lose your job. That doesn't make sense to me. It's not as flashy, and you don't have symposiums about those types of employment matters or immigration matters, but it is an answer that doesn't necessarily get in the way of what any follower of Mavanya and the American Samoan government are saying right now, which is be cautious when you're litigating about our culture and our people. I think just another interesting point to make maybe is, is this shows, I mean, this very debate, right, shows that just because we've switched to a consent paradigm doesn't give us the answers, right? Because then the question becomes, and, and you know, Christina Ponza talked about this morning, the idea of coerced consent, which of course has been you know, discussed in the literature and is important. I mean, you know, Puerto Ricans weren't citizens at the time of the insular cases either, and, and in fact, people have 
differing views as to whether or not the grant of citizenship was positive in terms of the island's ability to determine its own destiny. So that the notion that these concepts of self-determination uh, and so forth have taken root, then of course begs the question, uh, and you know, anticipating the next panel, of course, you know, what, what to do with that, how to operationalize it. There will always be disagreement in democratic societies. That's you know, the wonder of democracy. But then, right, there, there are going to be majorities and minorities, and we have to figure out exactly how to give the best possible expression uh, to the, the will of the people so construed. And it's an important point. Well, we're running out of time, but I would like to take a couple more questions quickly, if I can. Uh, so could I ask just uh, both of the people who are standing by the microphone to, to, to make your uh, questions, keep them brief, and then we'll take them both and then try to answer them. I would like to talk about the nature of the compact. Uh, my question is, uh, Law of Public 600 talks about uh, a compact with the people of Puerto Rico, but when the Constitution was done, uh, the Congress then sent it back uh, for three, uh, how do you say it? Corrections. Uh, well, changes. Uh, amendments, yeah. uh, for yeah. three amendments. Some argue that those three amendments um, indirect, indirectly uh, gave the Congress the, uh, the plenary powers uh, contradictory to the position that they gave to in the United Nations in the way of self-determination. And that is my, my question. What is the nature of that compact? Is it really bilateral or unitarily? Thank you. Thank you. And the second question? Uh, my question actually follows that one. And for our first, I, I know you're all constrained by time, but for our first panelist in particular, uh, if she can expand a little bit about what happened in 1950 and 52 with respect to Puerto Rico, and in 1953 in the UN, and um, the statements of the advocates uh, of the administration in, in 1950, uh, the federal administration, uh, the governor, of Puerto, elected governor of Puerto Rico, the resident commissioner of Puerto Rico, that Puerto Rico's fundamental relationship to the United States was not changing because of the authorization and, and approval of a constitution. Uh, as well as, um, in addition to the statements in the UN made in debate uh, at a time before the UN had adopted Resol General Assembly Resolutions 1514 and 1541, setting forth the criteria for uh, decolonization, taking non-self-governing territories off the, uh, off the list. And uh, so, and, and the vote in the UN itself, which is in the UN being like the Congress of the United States, a political party in which uh, most of uh, the, the vote in favor of delisting Puerto Rico uh, was done by plurality, not by majority of the vote with, with uh, abstentions from uh, many nations. So isn't there a little more complex history or can you expand upon that history? Uh, because it was clearly not the intent of the US government to say that Puerto Rico is no longer a territory and the U.S. Uh, has, has uh, consistently said that Puerto Rico is subject to the Territory Clause since that time. And, and finally, uh, the chief, the architect of going to the U.N. Uh, in 1953, uh, Jose Trias Monge, uh, wrote about this later after uh, he became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico, and didn't he <coughs> Uh, suggest that uh, they had not he had not achieved his objectives and indi indeed entitled his book Puerto Rico the oldest colony in the world um, so all I'll say is I will send you my draft chapter and hope that you'll get back to me with lots of edits because it sounds like you you're well uh, well versed in all of this but the the point that I did want to make in the limited time available was precisely that right that it has been made before that that a different understanding was being conveyed to the United Nations in public fora than was being said you know the the one thing and there's a really interesting um, and let me just see if I can find it in two seconds a comment by the uh, Puerto Rico Herald uh, on the um, 
50th and 53rd, I think, anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution, and I, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but it essentially said that that um, the Puerto Ricans and, and Governor uh, Munoz Marin and so forth were, were maybe overly optimistic in, in, again, using sort of Estado Libre Asociado, had this idea of what it could be, using Commonwealth in the English and kind of reassuring folks in Washington that nothing was really going to change, hoping that and, and that the courts would move us forward. And, and that you know addresses another issue that's come up in the comments that, of course, we can only give you know, too short shrift to right now, but it is, you know, we we're asking the first question was about litigation strategies, but of course we heard this morning political question doctrine is coming in to, to prevent litigation from really going forward. It, it's a legal and political, um, like so many issues that we deal with of, of great import and, and great um, you know, consequences, but also a lot of, of dispute, it, there, there's, it's, it's um, nothing cataclysmic is going to happen, right? It's going to be incremental. That's just the way these things work. And I think what we, we had, what we see in the 1950s is ambiguity, some unintentional, some quite deliberate for different political ends by different actors. Uh, but I guess the point I wanted to make is notwithstanding all of that, it doesn't prevent us hopefully from moving forward even though we de delisting happened. Um, and Roger Clark, in fact, has a piece on, on the, the trust territories in which he says, quite frankly, if the Puerto Rico case came before the United Nations Decolonization Committee, uh, you know, now it, it wouldn't have turned out the same way, but they were not sufficiently maybe um, attuned to some of the nuances of what was going on. It, it's, it's delisted, but it's still, if, if the people of Puerto Rico now feel that they haven't achieved a full measure of self-government, they have a right to try and attain that. The question, of course, is is how and, and the political realities are clear to everyone in the room. And of course, the Decolonization Committee uh, expresses itself annually in this regard. I'm glad in, in now that you helped clarify the Estado Libre Asociado and the word Commonwealth, because the framers of the Constitution of Puerto Rico who wrote in Spanish, this is the Associated Free State of Puerto Rico, recognized that if they went to the Congress to get a, approval of a constitution for the Associated Free State of Puerto Rico, they probably would have not have gotten that approval. And so the Constitutional Convention resolved not to translate uh, the name of the government of Puerto Rico honestly or straightforwardly and came up with the word Commonwealth. Here we're here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the word Commonwealth having no legal significance. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the panelists. And then we'll break for 15 minutes for the next panel.